my mother is a very smart, very intelligent woman, but uh, she got married at 17. She had me at 19. It was a different generation. So she didn't finish school, but very smart woman. So at the end of dinner, she tells everybody there's 20 people at the table. She said, that, you know, be quiet. Charles, you're in the New York Times, the moment who published this story. Can you explain it to me? I tried to read the article. I don't understand it. Can you explain it? So I explained what I just said to you. There's a strong correlation. And then my mother goes, and how long did you work on this research project for? So I said, about 14 or 15 months. So she turns to the table and she says, my son, the professor, it took him 14 months to show what everybody at this table already knows. <laughs> and that's the thing. Jews know that it's not the Christian form of anti-Semitism or the racist form of anti-Semitism. It still exists, but it's not the dangerous one in most places. It's the demonization of Israel, the only democratic country in the region, the only country with citizenship and a free press and a vibrant civil society, the only place, the only place in the region, with problems and contradictions, no, no less. And your Jewish friends, I don't know your Jewish friends, but I know, I know, and I can speak to colleagues, and I can speak to professors throughout Europe and throughout North America, and even in Israel. And I can speak to journalists, the finest publication houses in the world. And if you're Jewish and you want to have a career, and you want to be successful, and you want to have tenure, and you want to be at a good university, not in Idaho somewhere with, uh, with uh, corn, uh, and you want to be at a good, at a good uh, media outlet, you don't want to be in a small town and uh, I don't know where. You have to show your bona fides by being critical of Israel. And I guarantee if you speak to your Jewish friends and ask them confidentially, what is it like to defend Israel? What is it like to be identified or associated with this racist colonial Nazi, you know, uh, celebrating the death of others? Society. It's not easy. I don't know Greek society. I know Oxford, and I know London, and I know Paris, and I know New Haven, Connecticut, and I know New York. And if you're connected with that, you're finished. Your career is done. If you deal with these issues as a scholar, I can, the community of scholars that deal with these issues, the community of scholars, people who graduated from the best universities, high, serious, qualified, trained, intellectuals. They deal with this topic, their careers are smashed. Because we have never defeated the contemporary anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism that we can look back at Christian anti-Semitism and say, how horrific. We can look back at the Nazis and question, like, how did that happen? It's so outrageous. But at the moment, at the time, the Nazis had science and theology and philosophy and, you know, the rational thought was at the time the dominant way of perceiving reality was that the Jews were poisoning society. They were the cause of all problems. And I, I'm afraid, given the scholarship that my colleagues and I do at our institution, that, you know, we've published a lot of material from leading scholars, the demonization of Jews. I, there's an amazing paper I just read by a feminist scholar from Berkeley, California, Time Siegel. She just passed away. I reread some of her work at Berkeley. What she experienced as, a, as one of the leading feminist theorists of the 1960s and 70s. One of, she was at the forefront of feminist thought. But she defended the right of Israel to exist and what she experienced in Berkeley, California. She writes spectacularly about it. So I think we have to, to question, I, I, I really do, the, the perception of Israel, the perception of the apartheid wall. Think about it. Think about that. Here's a defensive, it's a wall. It's called, or it's a fence, whatever you want to call it, but it's called the apartheid wall in popular culture. I'm sure we've all heard about it. But that apartheid wall, what is it stopping? What's on the other side of Israel? 
Israel is a social democracy with problems and contradictions. Lots of problems, lots of contradictions. But what's on the other side? Is there something more creative? Is there something more egalitarian? Is there better music? Is there better culture? Is there better philosophy? Are women more emancipated? Is, is it more multicultural? Would you like to go tonight in Tel Aviv for a drink? Or should we go, where can we go on the other side of the wall? As men and women and leftists and rightists and anarchists, whoever we are, where do you want to go and have a, a drink tonight? Where do you want to be free? I, I would choose Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. I, I, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm a Zionist male, so what do I know? You know? But really, I, I mean, we have to really start to ask ourselves what's happening. And I think in Gaza, if you look to Gaza, this is a space that is being led by deprived people. The leadership of Gaza are deprived. They are morally, ethically deprived. As Benny Morris says, and I'll quote Benny Morris, the barbarians are at the door. These are people that want to liquidate Jews. And they're open and they're honest and they're clear. And I give them credit. I respect them for their clarity. They call for the extermination of all Jewish people. They call for the subjugation of women. A woman is not permitted in Gaza to go out into a public space without a male adult member of their family. That's repugnant. That's anti-democratic and sexist. They advocate the murdering of gay people. So you watch the video where, I don't know, some crazy, stupid Israelis are doing something? It's very possible. It's even probable. But look at the difference of the values of society. That's not to say that, uh, I hope you know, Israel, many problems, I can go into details about the problems. But what is the, uh, I'll be happy to answer your question, what's the alternative? This is Hamas. This is what these people are. So what do we do? Israel withdrew from Gaza, left it. But from a Muslim Brotherhood perspective, from a Hamas perspective, it's not possible, and I should have spoken about this earlier, it's not possible for a Jew, it's not possible for a non-practicing Muslim to be equal to a, a practicing Muslim. A woman cannot be equal to a man. A Jew cannot have self-determination anywhere on the Islamic land, anywhere in the region. It could just be Tel Aviv as a nation state. A Jew cannot be equal to a Muslim, even if it's in Tel Aviv, according to this twisted, reactionary, anti-democratic ideology. But I have news for you. The Jews of the Middle East and the Jews of Europe and the Jews of the region, we don't, and we won't be subjugated in second-class reasons. We will live equally with the other. We will promote social democratic principles. Israel is a social democracy with lots of room for improvement, no doubt. But it is a social democracy where Jews will be equal to non-Jews. To non My understanding of all this conversation is that uh, Israel is hiding behind his own finger. Nobody understands what his own country, his own people are doing. And we are like blaming each other, trying the finger. And, I don't know, so, some people do not have an understanding of democracy, do not have an understanding of equality and human rights, and they are more extreme than others. So, I think the best thing we can do is come together in, like, in terms of close and through time we will become more equal. I hope. I hope you're right, and I agree with you. But in, in a tragic way, I mean, the Israelis are defending themselves. In a tragic way, it's these guys who are killing their own people. It's Muslims who are the greatest victim to this insanity. It's not the Jews for now are protected. But we're standing by focusing on the Zionists who celebrate and do crazy things and the, the Netanyahu and the settlements. 
Because it's the Muslims who are killing the Muslims. So uh, who are we defending? I just have, you partially answered my question, but I understand your need to defend against the demonization of Israel, absolutely. But are you, as a scholar and as a scholar, basically, uh, comfortable with a middle road discourse? Like, I, myself, I'm a, a great believer in the, the good of Israel. It is indeed the only democracy in the region. Uh, no question about that. It has fought for many years to stay as a secular, in the sense of, sure, you have to be Jewish mostly, but it's not intertwined to such an extent. Not always successful on that level, of course. Women are absolutely equal. There's a lot to be to admire. Absolutely, we have a lot of Israeli friends who, really, there's a lot to admire. They're very similar to Greeks in many ways as well. But are you comfortable with a discourse that says, sure, I can believe in Israel. There's a lot of good, but there are a lot of problems, not only internally, as you have said, but I mean, I personally am not comfortable with what's going on in the Gaza Strip. I know Hamas is abominable. It's terrible. But what led to the growth of Hamas? The cause and effect. Surely Israelis must see that the more you press on the Palestinians in the, in the Gaza Strip, the more they will bounce back and hate Israel even more. And it's a vicious circle of hate, violence, hate, violence. And it just will never end. Hamas didn't come out of the blue. Hamas grew out of the despair of the people in Gaza. I mean, Gaza is a horrific place to live. So to a great extent, you can't blame them for being so fanaticized. And yet you can't, the Israeli people are also, should be free to go and sit in a cafe in Tel Aviv, which is a great city, without fearing a rocket coming over. But the cause and effect, it, do you not see that at all? The, that no. Hamas grew out of the despair? No, <laughs> no I don't. Okay. And you missed the beginning of the lecture. I know, so I, I, so so I apologize it's for okay. making me out of touch. No, it's but okay. I, I have this feeling over years. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So. so I said earlier, actually, the Muslim Brotherhood started about 100 years ago as a reaction to British colonialism. And Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the same. It's the Palestinian version of the, of the Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood has a very clear ideology. And the Hamas has a very clear ideology that goes back 100 years where they've taken Nazi ideology and European anti-Semitism and put it at its core, not on the peripheral edge of it, at the core of its ideology. And it's a genocidal, I'm choosing my word carefully, form of anti-Semitism. It's a genocidal construction of the other. In this case, Jews and other others. And this sort of notion of the cycle of violence, I think, is a misnomer. I don't think it exists. I think this is an ideology that is well thought out. It's philosophically strong, it's theologically strong, if I can use that word, it has a political and military agenda, and it's very sophisticated and deep. It's not just a reaction to Israeli aggression or bad policies, which I'm sure we could even agree that Israel was aggressive and had bad policies at various points. But this is an ideology that I said at the beginning of the lecture that we need to really study and understand. So it, it's not coming about because of Israeli bad policies, it's, it goes deeper. Zygmunt Brzezinski, which I think used to argue, that if all, only those stubborn Israelis would change, and this goes back to the other forms of anti-Semitism, the religious and the racist forms of anti-Semitism, Brzezinski and other intellectuals have argued that if only the Israelis would change, if only the, they would get rid of the settlements or they wouldn't be so stubborn, that jihad would go away. Right? The world would be saved. And I think that this is part of the misinterpretation of what's happening. A racist, it's not a racist, a Nazi-like ideology needs to be understood for what it is and to be fought. So I'm not defending Israel at all costs. I mean, I'm coming, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I defend Israel, I love Israel, I'm, I'm Israeli, I'm Jewish, so I have that part of it. But I also was very active, as Glenn was saying earlier, in the anti-apartheid movement. I was working with the leadership of the ANC. I come from kind of a social democratic uh, human rights tradition in, from Canada. Erwin Kotler was my professor. So I come from these issues really from a human rights perspective. And from a human rights, social democratic perspective, this is a repugnant ideology that needs to be defeated, regardless of who they're attacking. If it's Israelis 
or women or gay people or, or innocent people anywhere in the world. This ideology needs to be stopped in the name of human rights and social democracy, not in the name of Zionists or Israelis. Actually, it is the Muslims themselves that they should yeah. try to get rid of this extremist type. Exactly. My point was just that uh, we know that poverty fuels extremism. We've seen it here in Greece. A, a, a Nazi party that was 0.3% in 2009 is now 7%. It's not that Greece just Greeks woke up and were fascists. It, poverty sure. breeds extremism. Yeah. So maybe in the Gaza Strip, it's being these guys forget it. I totally agree with you. This is a scary law. But maybe the fact that they're so impoverished is just feeding. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we, I spoke earlier about how Islamists or political Islamists and neoliberals wanted to destroy the state. States are failing. There's a huge sort of power vacuum or a vacuum in societies that are being filled by this reactionary social movement in the Middle East and now I think increasingly in other parts of the world. However, it is much more poverty in education rather than actual poverty that brings about radicalization, anti, anti systemic the Trump phenomenon, all of that is not necessarily linked to economic uh, difficulties, much more to cultural and educational deep gaps. And when we are discussing this part of the no. They are economic. No. Education needs money. No, no, Good no, education no, no, needs no. money. It's what you teach, who teaches. Well, it's all money. No, no, no. Money is a building where you put inside the people to teach and be taught. And the equipment, etc. What you teach, if you teach radical Islamism, if your educational institutions uh, are basically catechism, religious catechism type of institutions, where this is what you teach the people. It's not only a matter of mass. Education is absolutely the crucial, 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 but poverty as in we don't have running water, uh, we can't go out of the house because they're shooting. I'm not saying it's Israel's fault on all levels, but bone-numbing poverty it's always going to require I must agree. But I agree about education. It's not just. No, 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 no. not just. So, uh, if we had, there's a couple more questions. <coughs> They, they believe in a two-state solution. 
If you poll Israelis, the, the vast majority of Israelis want a two-state solution. They want to live in peace with a social or a Palestinian state, not even a democratic state. Two people living in, in two states. Two states for two people. You cannot point to any political organizations or parties in the, in, in the Palestinian society, certainly in Gaza, and maybe Fatah, maybe Fatah would believe in a two-state solution, but if they would impose, if they would agree to a two-state solution, how long will Fatah stay in power in this transforming Middle East? Now, as a, you know, a semi-conscious human being, I don't want to be living in a valley next to people who are, want to exterminate me. And Israel has to defend itself or find a partner for peace. And the tragedy is, it's a tragedy. It's really a tragedy. Because on the other side of the border, whatever the border is, we don't have partners that are strong enough to, to implement a peace agreement. And we saw the Israelis withdrew from Gaza, and we see what happened, we see what happened in Gaza. We're seeing what's happening in Syria and Iraq. Jordan, God help us if Jordan falls. God help us. God help all of us if Jordan falls. You know, so uh, I, I, I would argue that yes, Netanyahu's made mistakes, and I, I'm not, I wouldn't vote for Netanyahu. I don't defend all of his policies. But really, in the face of a social movement that calls for the extermination of Israeli citizens, What would you do? And these are, these, are, these are, you know, these are people that have proven time and time again that they're, they're intellectual leaders, their they're rabbis are telling them that it's your obligation to go and kill Jews. Even if you have to become a, it's not a suicide bomber, you're a, you become a shaheed. So you do a good deed, you become a, you go to heaven. Or if you're not committing suicide, you're a shaheed, you're a, a martyr. Right. I need to okay. slowly close it because yeah. you don't want to spend the night on campus, right? Because I think I think the night is not the law. I think the much more. So, all right. So, if you want, to, if you want to talk to us, okay, Charles, we have uh, some soft drinks outside there. Uh, have some, you know, like uh, we should not uh, not go wasted. They should be wasted. And also, uh, uh, last because some of you can late. Uh, the next event is in three weeks' time, exactly the same time, but not here, in the upper level library. Dr. Matthias Krim, so he comes from Hamburg University, he will speak about Hitler's legacy and the Semitism in the Middle East. 1st of December, 7 o'clock, and it's very similar of it, all the things Charles mentioned uh, to the Nazis going to Egypt and spreading uh, the ideas of the Muslim government. Yeah? So he will talk about that, it's really interesting.